the late Ray Davey dedicated his life to peace and reconciliation, not just in Northern Ireland where he lived, but anywhere in the world where there are cultural divisions. His experiences as a prisoner of war convinced him that there was an alternative to violent conflict. Ray passed away on the 16th of April 2012 at the age of 97, but his legacy remains in the form of the Corrymeela community, which he founded in 1965 along with his wife Kathleen and a group of students from Queen's University Belfast. The Corrymeela community at the coastal town of Ballycastle in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, remains as a Christian community whose objective is the promotion of reconciliation and peace building. The following interview with Ray Davy was recorded at the Corrymeela Centre in the early 1980s. Ray was born and brought up in the Belfast suburb of Dunmurray, where his father was the local Presbyterian minister. He recalls living there during the late 1920s and early 30s. It was a village life, and I'm very grateful now that I was brought up in a village. It was a colourful place to be. There were all sorts of characters there. It was a real community where people knew each other. I mean, we, I remember Will Dake knew the blacksmith, and Jimmy Gray, the grocer, and Tib Kerr, who had a Ford car to hire, and uh, Andy Bruce, the barber. It was like happy families, you know, and it was a, a great place to grow up as a child. When he left the local school in Dunmurray, Ray progressed to the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, where he admits he was more interested in sport than studying. He excelled in rugby, playing first of all for his school and then for Ulster. In 1933, he went on to study for a degree at Queen's University. One of the memories I have those days is the sort of anxiety about what was going to happen. We didn't think very much about Ireland for some reason. Remember, if you think of the 30s, there was the Mussolini's exploits in Abyssinia, and then there was the Spanish Civil War in 1936, and then they always the figure of the Fuhrer in the background, and there was always this anxious feeling, look, how long can we keep out of it? And I did my degree at Queen's, and then I did theology. I did part of that at Assemblies College, as it was called then, in Belfast, and a sort of sandwich year. I did three years in all and did the middle one in New College in Edinburgh. And there was always this foreboding at the back of your mind, how long is it going to be till the war starts? Ray became assistant minister in First Bangor Presbyterian Church. I remember the very first Sunday I was there, uh, the church was packed and I had to take the service, not because I was taking the service, I should point out, I think my knees were knocking. Because it was the 3rd of September 1939, and Chamberlain had broadcast to the nation from Downing Street, I think at 11 o'clock, and he said that from this time on we were at war with Germany. I can tell you that was a very emotional service, you see. The, the young people were filled with foreboding. They didn't know what they were in for. And a lot of the old people had been through the last war. So that was quite an experience. A new era had begun. The whole tempo of life changed. Many of Ray's friends from Queen's joined up. Instead, Ray joined the YMCA with a commission to go to the front line. The boat set out from Glasgow, travelling up the Clyde, but the ship hadn't gone too far when... We were bombed. It must have been very near Rathlin. German bombers came and uh, we were very, very lucky. The bomb landed on the water line, just missed us, right down the side of the ship and exploded there and blew a hole in the side of the ship. And the machine gunned the decks and I understood they killed about a dozen people. Well, we were right down in bed. Never did we get out of bed quicker. And uh, anyway, the cruisers circled around us for several hours and then they signaled for us to sail back to the Clyde on our own steam. So I had to spend another three months 
in England and eventually we set out, this time on a good Belfast built ship, the Andes had only been uh, built in Harlan and Wolf in 1939 and launched then, a beautiful ship. The general strategy of the YMCA was to move as close to the front line as possible because that's where they were most needed. Ray was involved in establishing YMCA centres like the one at Tobruk in North Africa. We are right on the front line and it was the only place where people could get in England to buy or sell and we ran a tea service where people or biscuits were was have queued that all day long. Fellas just come in from the front line uh, 15 or 20 miles away and maybe nearer. So we ran everything in that. We ran a, a, a canteen service, we ran educational programs, I had a library, concerts, a gramophone was there, got the BBC news and newspapers and there's always somebody if you wanted to talk or welfare work, anything we could do and a lot of the army chaplains used it and was used. Talk about ecumenical, I mean every group used that. The Jews used it, the Brethren used it, Catholics used it, the Church of England, uh, the Reformed Church, everybody. And the YMCA, we ran our own service on Sunday night. The Tobruk Centre became a place of dialogue and listening. It tried to meet the needs of the individuals who came there. A war was raging. Many needed help. They were lonely, anxious and bewildered. The centre was a prototype for a Christian community to be founded by Ray many years later. But for now, the date was the 20th of June, 1942, and things had taken a turn for the worse. During the day, these soldiers began to straggle in in twos and threes and said they had been overrun. Well, what had happened was the Germans had broken in. And uh, that night at six o'clock, we were very quiet. And I said I'd go outside and see if I got any. Yeah, I got out and, and the, outside the door and here was this fellow come along with a Tommy gun. And uh, I no hero, I beat back in again. And he came in and he was dressed in a sort of... Uh, you know those camouflage jackets with a helmet on and we were made to file out on the street and we had all small kit ready but we didn't even time to we didn't mess about with these people so we were lined up and in a sort of pen very humiliating your whole life changes suddenly you're under authority you can't move the rest of the war was to be spent under authority as prisoner 261050 it was while being held in one of the transit prisoner of war camps that Ray discovered how easy it was to get into trouble. It's very nearly benefit in, in the first one we're in. Over my watch, uh, there were these crowds, and they were a pretty vicious crowd. There were Sanusi tribesmen, and uh, obviously didn't like anything to do with the British. And this fella had a fez on and a sort of bandolier here across with cartridges in it. Well, they were guarding us, and this sweet Italian corporal, um, I could see he was going along taking watches. Well, I was way down the line. I just, just lift my watch and stuck in my pocket. Well, one of these guards saw me do this, and this fella came along, and he pulled me out, and he gave me three thumps in the face. And my friend Harold Barker, I said, Ray, hold it. He thought I was going to hit this fella. Little did he have any I wasn't shaking in my shoes, but there was a fellow behind me with a bayonet, and if I hadn't moved, I would have been finished. Anyway, he was so annoyed with me that he forgot about the watch, and I got, got the watch. After a short time, Ray was flown to Italy. For the next three years, until the end of the war, he was held in six prisoner of war camps, three in Italy and three in Germany. On the 13th of February 1945, Ray was being held in a Colditz-type castle about 15 miles from the city of Dresden. That night, the raid started. There were thousands of bombers come over. It was like a, a big, big motor race going on over the roof. You could hear the roar of these planes going through. And then the sky lit up, and you could have read the smallest print at... Uh, 12 o'clock at night in the dark 
and the German guards go and got hysterical and they made us go into the basement and uh, great shouting and all the rest of it and this bombing went on and went for an hour and uh, we knew it was Dresden because you could see the sky and you hear the, hear the bombs. Well then <clears throat> it all stopped about 12. An hour went in and it started all again. Another raid came over. And then the next day the Americans came over and did the daylight bombing. Well, if you go back to Dresden, what happened in Dresden? The first raid was thousands and thousands of heavy bombs. Alas, these were mostly residential areas, the old city, Altstadt. They weren't in the marshalling yards. They didn't get the main bridge over the Elbe, the crucial strategic point. They got the residential place. These blockbusters broke the ruse open and the next raids were on sandries. Do you see what it was like? Cracking a nut and pouring in fire. And what happened was the city went on fire. All these fires joined together and they caused what is called a heat storm. The temperature rose to, let's say, 1,000 degrees. And that meant there was terrific suction and I heard some of the most horrific stories, I've read them, of what happened. A woman running away from Dresden with a child under her arm was sucked back in again. Horror books couldn't convey what it was. So they reckon there were, no one knows, 100,000 killed um, in that raid. It's very hard in words to convey what that was really like. And remember, that was with conventional bombing. That wasn't with a nuclear bomb. Eventually, the war ended. Ray was released and returned home to Belfast in May 1945. Eight months later, he married Kathleen Burroughs. He had met her first on holiday in the North Antrim town of Ballycastle back in the 1930s. After they married, Ray spent six months as assistant minister in a Belfast church and was then offered the post of a full-time Presbyterian chaplain to Queen's University. He took up his appointment at the beginning of the academic year in 1946. There were no conditions laid down. There were no parameters to go on. There were no traditions. It hadn't been done before. That's wrong in the sense that it was done part-time by a professor in the Assemblies College but the university was much smaller at that point. And uh, this gave me a lot of thought. How should you work there? there was, there's no buildings, no plans, no blueprints. It was there, and you had to sort out what you would do. One of the first things Ray felt was needed at Queen's was some kind of meeting place, similar to the YMCA centre at Tobruk during the war. He didn't want a chaplaincy that would be built around one person. He'd been impressed by visits to the Iona community in Scotland and was influenced by its founder and leader, George MacLeod. One of his great contributions in the understanding of Christianity was his emphasis on the importance of the community idea. The Christian gospel is not just for individuals, but it concerns the body, the community. Uh, the fellowship, and uh, this spoke to me. We'd seen examples of this in prison camps where we were together and we needed each other. Uh, if we'd been on our own, we'd have been in trouble, but you needed the support, bearing each other's burdens and so on. So we started off and eventually we had a flat and then I was able to get a larger building. Lucky to get that, it was the Peace Thanksgiving Fund and uh, we were able to get money for that and we bought uh, an old house near the university. It was ideal for that because the rooms were very large and we took over number seven College Park East and started off the community idea <clears throat> and it, it really worked because the students were glad to come in there and uh, it was very informal. We had various activities, uh, social and uh, 
discussion groups and Sunday night we had the Padres R, a continuation of one of the radio programs of the war. And uh, then we began to launch out into running residential conferences or house parties and uh, a whole lot of things. It was all these growing new ideas coming along. Eventually we ran a Sunday service and uh, I was always keen on trying to be a catalyst that got people to do their own thing. And there's a lot of expertise among the students, a lot of gifts and things that they could do and I would get them to do it. I didn't want it to be dependent on me and uh, many things grew out of that. Among other things pioneered by Ray was a student travel scheme to enable young people to visit other countries in Europe. Due to his own wartime experiences, he felt that it would be especially good for students to visit Germany and Italy. One of the places I went to in Italy was a youth centre that had been built by voluntary labour way up in the Alps. And there I met a very interesting man called Tullio Vinai. He was a pastor in the Waldensian church. And he had come through the war. And Italy had had a very rough time in the war. And uh, he was up in the north and he became the youth pastor. And uh, after the war, there was a lot of these young people left with sort of high and dry. And he decided we will build a Christian center. And it was built by voluntary labor in a beautiful part of the Alps to be a symbol of it. was called agape. And agape is the, one of the Greek words for love, the Christian love. And uh, they called it agape. And it really became a center of reconciliation. And we had the privilege of going there and we immediately linked into that, the vision they had. And the young people would say, well, look, this is marvelous in Italy. It's bringing young people from all over Europe together. What about Ireland? And uh, <clears throat> one of the up upshoots of that was that a lot of those young people began to think, well, why couldn't we do something like this in Ireland? Ray and a group of students began to share their vision of a similar type of Christian community for Ireland. Meetings, retreats and days of prayer were held. Little progress was made for almost a year, but then it was learned that a large holiday house was for sale. It was situated on a hilltop overlooking the Atlantic Ocean about a mile east of the coastal town of Ballycastle, County Antrim. We met together and we decided that we would go ahead and try and, and purchase this place. I, I had had my eyes on for quite a while. I'd come down here on holiday as a schoolboy and I knew of its existence. It was uh, built by the Holiday Fellowship. And so in 1965, we put in a bid and we were fortunate enough to get it. And uh, we bought the field behind the house as well, which really gave us room, seven or eight acres, where we could build, I suppose the most appropriate term would be a small campus. The newly acquired building at Ballycastle was transformed during the summer of 1965. There were people like Billy McAllister, a retired railway engineer who organised all the digging, painting, carpentry and electrical work. He later became the first warden at the centre. But it was mainly students who had the free time to come to summer work camps and with a paintbrush or hammer in hand help to realise the vision. But what kind of people were they? A great number of these young people were in their own churches and a few would have been uncertain and on the edge maybe questioning but by and large uh, most of them were quite a lot were very much committed uh, but I think it's right to say that they were young they some of them were impatient they were pretty sharp and they're asking a lot of questions uh, they're asking questions about uh, church disunity. They're asking questions about the political situation in Ireland. And they were contrasting that with the sort of affirmations that the Christian church has made about we are not divided all one body. We 
our oneness in Christ, uh, the body of Christ, and uh, so many of the affirmations that the Christian gospel makes, and it didn't tie up with so much that went on in everyday life. Then there was the whole question about the church and the wider society. Had the church nothing to say about social and political affairs? Uh, was the church a sort of ark of refuge away from the hard realities of the of the world? Uh, had it nothing, no word of hope, no word of interpretation? And when they went back to the Bible, they felt that they were told to believe in a God who was the God of the whole of creation. The sovereignty of God was the great phrase the reformers used. God was concerned about the whole of life. You couldn't uh, insulate religion to one part of life like you do in a public library. <clears throat> the gospel way is a way of living, not a department, department of life. The gospel isn't just private solace, but it is something that deals with the totality of life. The kingdom of God is about right and just and fair relationships. And it was a sort of widening of the whole outlook of religion that we thought was very important. And a lot of these things were later to be taken up in the Corrymeela community. The opening and dedication service for the building at Ballycastle was held on the 30th of October 1965. It was declared open by Tullio Vine, whose Agape community in the Alps in Italy had inspired Ray and the other founding members from years earlier. It was a Christian act of dedication, very memorable, and in his speech I always remember it. Uh, and uh, then Parallel with that, another event took place a wee bit later. That was in Easter 1966. Remember, that was the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. We decided that we would do an event to try and be positive about that. And so we asked Terence O'Neill, Captain Terence O'Neill, to come and make the key speech. And he made a great plea for the community relations, one of his great speeches. And why I use that, there were the two sides. The first was the Christian dedication of the place, but always parallel with that was the social and political commitment. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That those two, those th that twinning to me seemed to be very important to Curry Miller, that it was not just a place where you came for religious exercises, important as they are, but it was prayer linked with life, worship linked with what was going on in the world. So those two events were important at the beginning, that they set the standard for the future. But the future turned out to be a tragic one for Northern Ireland. Just a couple of years after Corrymeela opened, the troubles began. I think in one way it made us realise that our work was very important. <laughs> you could say in a cynical way, as soon as you boys started, things got worse. But I think it was an anticipation that we realised that things were not all right. And in a way that we had been brought about for a time like this, it was quite a traumatic thing to see the ordinary decent people barricading their streets because of the, the fear of uh, people from the other side coming in to cause havoc and this going on on both sides. And one of the things that we did was to try and be there to reassure them. This was before the actual shooting started. And then when internment, one of the most vivid memories I had was when internment started, the terrific upheaval there was in West Belfast. And uh, one of our girls was working up there in a sort of a device centre. And she rang me and said, could you not get some of the children out of here? And we organised a whole fleet. I remember going up with my own, uh, with a minibus, and there was a barricade in the road, and two or three fellas there were with petrol bombs and wondering what to do, and I rang up someone inside, and they sent the children on foot, and we collected them. I wondered, oh, they were burning, they were burning a lorry, 
And uh, I remember having a discussion with a man that owned the lorry, and he, he said to them, well, I'm as good a Republican as you are. And uh, we were sitting there wondering what was going to happen to us. But the children came through at that time, and we bought through two or three hundred children here. And they stayed in the schools and all at Ballycastle and up here for two or three weeks. Several of the shops came up and offered to give us things for the children, clothes and so on. And I think that was important. And the schools opened their doors for us. I remember going to one school, I better not mention which one. And I asked the headmaster about having the school. He says, well, there really should be a committee meeting, but here are the keys get on it. <laughs> so we got the school open and uh, has quite a few. And the, the kitchens open, the staff came and worked. That was very interesting at the very beginning of the Trumbulls. And a lot of those people, some of those people are still our best members because I felt that we wanted to try to do something. Many people can testify to being helped through Corrymeela since its opening. But could the social aspect of its work not have run smoothly enough without a Christian commitment? Well, I wouldn't be interested in it. And I don't think a lot of the people we have would be interested in it, would become sort of social welfare agents. And I think we have a lot of those now. I think they do good work. But the work that Corrie Miller does is an expression of Christian reconciliation. At the heart of what we are doing, we believe, and we say this, with a very serious service of dedication or rededication every year, at uh, the beginning of the year in January. A very solemn de de agreement of each member to be used as instruments of God's peace. And when you talk about Christian reconciliation, then you've got to work out in concrete terms what you mean. Otherwise, it's just a past phrase. And it means bringing families together that have been hurt by the violence. Families of the cross group all have lost someone. They're very closely linked with us. Uh, prisoners' wives. I was in prison and you visited me. People who are on the poverty line, one-parent families who can't afford a holiday. Our society is full of people that have very deep needs, and we try to be open and aware and alive to them as part of our Christian community. Then, as well as that, we have a group we'll be meeting this Saturday, a prayer group, where a very wide range of people will come together and will <coughs> remember and share about the situation, pray about it. And I think this is a very important thing. It's terribly important to keep the devotional spirituality together with the outreach and not let them get separate. I think the tragedy of so much Christianity today is those two have got separated. And you've got people who are Christian activists, but in many ways have got away from the root and source of the gospel. And then on the other hand, you get people who are very spiritual but have forgotten the grim realities of the outside world and, in a sense, are being ineffective. Do you see what I mean? To try and keep those together. But we need each other. I think the evangelical needs the person with, the, shall we say, the wider social and political vision. But the person with that point of view needs the evangelical. You need the two together. And mark my words, as you go on with this work, you realise... It's, it's not just social work. There's no way through that way. As Paul says, <clears throat> we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And I think that the whole dimension of prayer and spirituality is not a polite <coughs> raising the colours, Christian colours, and then getting on with what you call the real work. It is really part of the most important thing that we can do. It is the whole life of of depth of prayer and uh, working at that level. And I think that we're, we're discovering that here.